I think we had some uh, examples working through last time. Uh, did we finish the example D, X, L, and X? Uh, X to the X? Did you guys do that one? Yeah. Wow. We did F, the one that gave us E. So, let's just finish things up with the This is why I said we should multiply rules 
memorize rules in their entirety because it will cause you to make mistakes. What is the rule that says we multiply the exponential by the derivative? What is that rule? What rule tells you that you multiply by the derivative of the power of an exponential? Oh, God. What does the rule say? Not a to the x. We know one for e to the u, right? What is that? Come again? No. That's only a part of the rule. What is the entire rule? The rule is d d u of e to the u of u prime e to the u. Right? That's the rule. You do this when you see that. Do you see that? Okay, that rule does not apply because that's not the rule. This is why there is danger in only memorizing one side of a rule. You need to remember the d dx because otherwise you're going to be doing it when you shouldn't be doing it. Memorize the rules. You shouldn't be even thinking about it. You're not in the right situation. Yes? I move what? You move the limit up? Yes, you can do this. It's, it's optional, but it, it's, it'll be helpful for a lot of people to actually see it. Limits pass through continu continuous functions, so we can do that. We're not even thinking of multiplying by the derivative of the power because that's not the rule. We memorize the entire rule, both the left and the right side, so I know when the rule applies and when it doesn't. Okay, what are we doing next? Now we have to worry about this thing, right? And what is that? If I directly plug in x in it to infinity, what does that go to? Well, the x would go to in infinity. What would ln of 1 plus 1 over x go to? Ln of 1. Ln of 1, which is? 0. So that's infinity to the 0. What's that? E to the 0. No. Indeterminate. 0 times infinity is indeterminate. You don't know what that's going to be. What do we do? Times. 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 
derivative. So it's u prime over u. Uh, derivative of the denominator? Uh, negative 1 over x. That cancels. So now I end up with e to the limit as x approaches infinity of 1 over 1 plus 1 over x. Does uh, that make. Uh, can we do that limit? Uh, the x will just become 1 because you'd have 1 in the top, you'd have 1 in the bottom plus 1 over x, but as x is going off to infinity, that's going off to 0. So it's actually 1, not 0, which is why you can't just assume it's 0. It's indeterminate. It could be anything. So it's e to the 1. That's why it's e. So yes, I know I told you to memorize that this is e, but I still want you to know how to go through the process because it's still a good example to really examine the kind of uh, thing that you would need to do for a group like this. You guys need to memorize the rules. You need to memorize the entire rules, the left side and the right side. You need to, that, because the left side tells you when the rule applies. The right side tells you the actual manipulation. You need to memorize the entire equation. Uh, you need to know about, so I'll, I'll get to you. You need to know about the strategies and certain processes. You need to know if something is a power and it's giving you a problem, figure out a way to get an ln in there. Not by randomly ln'ing things. If it's an equation, you can lock both sides. If it's not an equation and you only want to manipulate one side of something, you can rewrite it as e to the ln of that thing. Right? That's how you're going to get the ln in there. You should understand that that's a strategy. That's a process that you can go through to get something to happen. You should also know not to naively be plugging in values when you have things that are indeterminate forms. 1 to the infinity is not always 1. 0 times infinity is not always 0. You don't know what these are. You have to bring it to the convenient indeterminate forms in order to be able to uh, evaluate those with L'Hopital's rules. The two that L'Hopital's rule work with is infinity divided by infinity or 0 divided by 0. Every other indeterminate form, you don't know what it is. So you have to rewrite it somehow. And another useful thing for logs is that they allow you to rewrite things. They allow powers to become products. They allow uh, multiplication to become addition, division to become subtraction, etc. So logs are really useful in that sense. Uh, what was your question? Um, so how do we know to divide by 1 over x? Oh, because we know that I want this or that. Because convenient to have. I mean, convenience is a strong word. <laughs> like, you don't want to have this, but of all the indeterminate forms, these are the two best ones to have. Because you know how to deal with them. You have like a mechanism for how to deal with them that works most of the time. Uh, in a limit form. Right? So here, seeing that I had a multiple, I had something times something, I don't want that. I want something divided by something. So I have to find a way to write that multiplication as a division. What I can do is just rewrite one of them as a reciprocal and move it under. Right? That's also a very common thing. If you want to go from a multiplication thing to division, uh, you can always do that. Right? So if you have 2 times x, that's exactly the same as x divided by a half. Right? You can do that at any point. That's algebra or arithmetic. So that's what we do. You have this. That's indeterminate. I don't know what that is. Uh, well, there's zeros and infinities. I need to be able to get to one of the convenient forms, either 0 over 0 or infinity over infinity. You could have moved the ln in the bottom and put it as ln of blah, blah, blah to the minus 1 power. And you'd have the same effect. You'd, in fact, get uh, you'd have a uh, uh, infinity over infinity in that case, you take the limit, you'll still end up with 1 at the end of the day. So you just pick one of the guys, move it down to the bottom, that gives you a fraction. Hopefully, quote unquote, the fraction is 0 over 0 or infinity over infinity, and that allows you to apply the Lipton's rule, which hopefully is going to simplify to a point where it's not indeterminate anymore. I know exactly what that limit is, it's 1. And then when we use the rule, how do we get negative 1x squared? Come here. 
Like, how did you get negative? Like, we multiplied by negative one x squared, but where did that negative one x squared come from? That's the chain rule. The derivative of ln of anything is one over the thing times the derivative. Derivative of ln u is u prime over u. So this is either one over u. That's the u prime. So we use the chain. We can't forget the chain. So I did this because there's a rule that allows me to rewrite anything as e to the ln of anything. Uh, here I checked, doesn't work out, so then I did this because there's a rule that allows me to do that. Uh, once I have 0 over 0, I know there's L'Hopital's rule, so there's a rule that allows me to do this. Within the powers, I know when I'm differentiating, the rule is the chain rule that allows me to do that. And then I get this, which I can evaluate easily by plugging in. Every step you take, there's a rule that tells you that you can take that step. If you don't know why you're doing something, it's a bad thing. You're in a bad situation. Those are good questions, but those are questions you should have been asking me like weeks ago. How did you go from this step to that step? How did you do that? Why, why is that true? These are things you guys should have been asking a long time. Every single step, there's a rule in my head that I'm applying. And by the way, the entire rule is in my head, so I don't use it when I shouldn't use it. I know that there are certain rules that apply when I see LIN. There are certain rules that apply when I see DDX. There are certain rules that apply in various situations. You have to remember the entire rule so you know what the situation is. So I know it's like, um, it's always a thing. Like, you know, when I give quizzes and there's no partial credit, and they're like, they, they write down the rule this. And of course on a quiz, I'm like, no, it's, it's totally wrong. But come on, it's almost right. No, you're wrong in a very specific way that's going to cause you to get in trouble. You need this, trust me. You need it. It's super important. When I give you a rule, it's very important to memorize the entire rule in detail. You know what the rule is when you write it down. You know what each piece in the rule means, right? I would know that this is the independent variable. U is a function of x. E is a constant. Right? You should know not only how to write down the rule in its entirety, but know what each piece in the rule represents. Right? E is a specific constant. Then there's a rule that does this. A, D, A, well, times U prime. That's right up front. Right? Now there, A happens to be any constant, including E itself, that is positive. So I can write down that entire rule and I know, okay, that's my independent variable. A is any constant greater than zero. U is a function of x. That is the rule for how to evaluate this expression. If there's a ddx here, that takes effect. If there's no ddx here, that does not take effect. So how do you deal with infinity minus infinity? Huh? You can't do half of it. So remember the convenient indeterminate forms. Division, right? It has division in it. You also know that getting to division from a situation of multiplication is easy, right? Just move one guy under the bottom and write it as the reciprocal. So probably if you have an indeterminate form, you want to get it to be a convenient indeterminate form. You want to get it to a state of division. 
One way to get into a state of division is to first get into a state of multiplication. If you have a sum, how do you get into a state of multiplication? Yeah? Factoring. Factoring. That's literally what factoring is, right? To take a sum of things and write it as a product of things. What would you factor? So now that looks like a product. Now what does that product actually look like? So as x goes to infinity, e to the x will go to infinity times, what does this go to? This expression here. Huh? It's just one? How do you know it's just one? Because isn't e to the x bigger than x? e to the x is bigger, right? This is coming from one of those old limit techniques, right? Step five, comparing the different kinds of functions. I have a polynomial divided by an exponential. Exponential wins, right? So the denominator is approaching infinity a lot faster than the numerator. So uh, this part here is going to approach zero. So that one approaches one. By the way, Technically, for this little part here, it would approach infinity over infinity, and you could apply L'Hopital's rule to say that I can write this as 1 over e to the x and let x go to infinity, which gives you 0 that way. So even if you forgot that, knowing L'Hopital's rule, you know, you could actually figure out that that was 0, like also, in another way. So uh, that's infinity times 1. What is infinity times 1? Infinity, not indeterminate. That's, that's pretty clear. One times a huge number is a huge number. So that's not in an indeterminate form. It didn't even have to go all the way here. That's it. That's infinity. Not only know, see what I'm doing, but understand the strategy behind what I'm doing, why I'm doing what I'm doing. Also understand that literally every line I write down, there's a rule that I'm applying in my head that I've memorized in its entirety. And that's how I got to the next step. Nothing is random. I also have the strategy that when it comes to indeterminate forms, I like certain divisions, namely 0 over 0 or infinity over infinity. An easy way to get to a division is to get to a multiplication first, then go to the division by dividing by a reciprocal. An easy way to go to a multiplication when you don't have a multiplication is factoring. These are no, not normal things that you should automatically know. Yeah? I did? What did I What did uh, I say? It was a limit of x as, uh, as it approaches 0 from the right of x down x. I asked earlier, you guys said I did I didn't do this? I didn't do this? Oh. So the thing with this is I actually did it in an earlier problem, like I wrote it out of order. But we actually found this guy in order to find the x to the x problem. But let's just, let's just run through that guy since apparently we don't remember a lot at this moment. It doesn't, it won't hurt to actually go over this. I, I don't remember what number this was uh, or letter. So let's say we're looking at the limit as x approaches 0 of x ln x. Well, the first thing I would do is just see, just eyeball this, you know, using the, the first principle of limits. Just plug in the number. Does it actually make sense to plug in the number? Well, if I plug in 0 for x, this will go to 0 times, if I plug in 0 for x here, as I'm approaching 0 from the right, I actually can't plug in 0. But I approach 0 from the right, I get negative infinity, right? Because I know what the log graph looks like.
person zero from the right, it goes off to negative infinity, so I know that. Right? Uh, so that's zero times infinity. What's that? We don't know what it is. That's indeterminate. How do I get to a situation where I can figure out what it is? Divide by 1 over x. So move the x in the denominator and write it as that. Now I do the same check. Approaching 0 from the right, this guy's going to give me negative infinity. Approaching 0 from the right here, this guy's going to give me positive infinity. That is infinity over infinity. That's a, of all the bad situations, that's one of the best ones to have. Uh, because I actually know how to deal with that. I'm going to use L'Hopital's rule. L'Hopital's rule says the limit, leave the limit the same. Then if you have 0 over 0 or infinity over infinity, the limit is actually going to give you the same value as the limit of the derivative of the top and the derivative of the bottom separately. I'm not applying the quotient rule. I'm just differentiating that and differentiating that. Now, at this point, if you plug in 0 for x, you would get, again, infinity over infinity, or infinity over negative infinity. But one thing you want to do after you apply L'Hopital's rule is simplify it to see if you really need to apply it again. Um, simplifying this would look like 1 over x times minus x squared by two change flip. This will give you the limit as x approaches 0. These would cancel of minus x. As x approaches 0, what does minus x approach? Also 0. So that actually is not indeterminate. This limit is 0. There was a problem when we were doing uh, when we were doing the limit as x approaches zero plus of x to the x. We literally had to we computed this limit by finding that limit in the power. So technically, we already did this because how you would deal with this because the power is an issue is you would rewrite it as e to the ln of x to the x, and you take that power and bring it down in front, and then you have to figure out what that is. Here, I get 0, plug in 1 here, I get 0, 0 times 0, that is 0. So 
that gives me a nice indeterminate form right away, zero for zero. Now I'm going to apply a low dose rule. So the limit is going to stay the same. I'm going to differentiate the top, so the top becomes what? Bottom becomes? give us something nicer. If I plug in 1, uh, I would get 0. Oh, I get 0 over 0 again. Uh, before I go ahead, so I could simplify this a little bit to see maybe I don't need to open those real again. So I write this as, uh, just multiply by x over x probably. Plug in one, get zero over zero again. So this that didn't help. Uh, so let's actually do locals again. Because as long as that situation presents itself, locals is applicable. Differentiate the top, I get one. Differentiate the bottom, I would get one plus ln x plus one. By the product rule applied to x ln x. And at this point, I can plug in 1. This is going to go to 0, and I would be left with a half. This limit is a half. test one. Some of you obviously aren't ready, but there is time. Stay focused. Get your head right. Listen to my advice and you'll be fine. I do realize that sometimes it comes off as me being just overly dramatic with stuff. No, this is important. You need to remember this. You're like, it's really not the important one. I understand that, that idea. I promise you. Everything I tell you is important. Every time I deduct a point or something, it's important. So just take all that seriously, and you will be funny. Memorize the rules. Memorize the entire rules. So know your definitions, know your rules, know your formulas, know your strategies. So. That comes down to when you see a certain type of situation, you should know that there are standard ways to deal with that situation. Once you know the standard ways, nothing is going to stump you at that point. I know what I'm looking at. I have a rule that tells me how to manipulate that thing. And I have strategies that tell me, in this situation, do this, not that. What's going what's to stump you if you know all that? Nothing. I can throw all the trick questions I want at an exam. It's not going to matter. I'm not going to throw trick questions on purpose for no reason. I mean, I, I gave you the the reviews and solutions. Like, I'm gonna, it's gonna look like that with the differences that I described on the thing. Because in the reviews, there were some problems in the bonus section that I'm I'm putting in the actual test, and I told you what those things were. So make sure when you're 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 reading the review, don't just run to the problems. Actually, read the things that I typed up before I listed the problem. So, uh, what we're going to do 
do now is a different topic entirely. That ends our discussion on limits. It's pretty much the last thing I'm going to tell you about computing limits for the rest of the semester. We are going to still be using limits for other stuff towards the end of the semester, but this is the last technique that we learned. Um, right now, I actually want to move on to a different topic. Pass these around. So this is one of the topics that will show up as a bonus on the test. So technically speaking, you're not responsible for it, but if you study everything, you feel confident, you know everything, you might just as well learn this, maybe get a few extra points. So that way it'll be possible for you to get more than 100 on a test and you have a cushion for the next test because anything you get over 100, I just push it to the next test. Uh, any more copies needed? So this new topic is related rates. So the thing with these guys is it's uh, they come in the form of word problems. So on the on the next page you'll see like a bunch of related rates examples. I have 12 examples here. I don't know if I'll go through all of them. Um, but you will have uh, a lot of uh, situations to deal with. Well, not all our situations. Pretty much, if you know everything that's in the box on the first page, which you should read through carefully the first couple times, do a few examples by reading through this carefully the first couple times. After that, once you remember the things in bold, it'll be fine. So I know it looks like a lot of text to remember, but it's very natural to remember once you do a few examples. You, you just need to know the six steps that you need to know uh, how to get through these problems. So it's actually an application of derivatives, and the problems themselves come in the form of word problems. So let's actually talk about that. Related to this, this next, I forgot what section it is, 3.10 or something like that. Related rates. So it turns out uh, if quantities are related via an equation, then so are their rates. So two related quantities automatically have related rates. There, there will be an equation relationship between the rates of change of the individual quantities. Um, you could have two or more, usually in this class there will be two things that you're relating. Um, very rarely three, but um, usually you can think of this as we're relating two things and we want to talk about their rates. So, um, one thing you'd want to know, uh, I'll, I'll give you some, now I explained a lot on the handout here, but I'm just writing down some of the highlights here. How to know you're looking at a related rates problem? Because by the end of the semester, you're going to learn how to deal with uh, several kinds of word problems. So you're, you're going to want to know how to identify them. Uh, so the first thing is going to be one. A relationship between quantities are described. Or is described. Um, then you're told the rates of one or several.
been asked to determine statement uh, so the word rate here applies to rate in the actual conventional sense uh, rate here means the independent variable Calculus, we do kind of make that a little bit more abstract, but in a situation like this, it's strictly like, yeah, we're talking about the regular speed velocity that everyone else will be talking about. Um, but, uh, so this is a word problem, so you're going to see it as a word problem, and something's going to happen. They're going to tell you about a situation where you're describing certain quantities, and you're told how fast one of them is moving, and you want to know how fast the other one is moving. Uh, so that's basically related to rates. So that's the, that's the like, the giant overall vague template of a related rates problem. Hey, these two things are related in this way. This one is moving this fast. How fast is this one moving? Right? Basically, if you see a question like that, it's a related rates problem. Now, once you recognize the, it's a related rates problem,
So that's very important. T is the independent variable. So that parenthetical statement, that's why that's important. So your x isn't the independent variable anymore. So if you call something x, it's not like the input. That x is the also a function of the input. What you're going to do now from step uh, six, you're going to plug in all the knowns and solve for the unknowns. One thing that could happen at this point, every now and then you get here, uh, you are going to have too many unknowns that you can't actually solve for the guy you want. Whenever you find yourself in that situation, do not panic. Walk, don't run, back to step four. Okay? So anything you're missing at step six, you can go back to step four to find that missing information. Once you go up to step four, you get the missing information, you come back to step six, you plug in what you need to plug in, and you solve for this. Okay? Now, that is, you know that process, you know every related race problem, right? They're all the same, right? The specific functions are going to change, but that's it. The process is always going to be the same. You always do this first, that second, that third, that fourth, that fifth, that sixth. Every time. The only thing that can happen is sometimes you might skip over a step. So usually step two will be skipped if they already gave you the equation that you need for step four. Step two, the point of doing step two really is for you to figure out the relationship in step four. A lot of time the relationship is going to be based on the geometry of the situation. So you know that if you draw a diagram and it's a triangle, okay, now I'm thinking Pythagoras' theorem, maybe Sokotoa, maybe it, the diagram will give you ideas as to what the relationship you want will be. Right? So that is the six step process. And here I guess we've mentioned some pro tips. So geometry is going to be very important. So I do want you to remember the common areas, the common problems for areas and volumes and, and, and circumference and all that thing of circles and rectangles and squares. So I mentioned some things here that you probably want to look up if you forgot them. Um, because the, a, a lot of times the geometry of the situation is going to be what we're going to use to solve it. So, that being said, that's actually all I need to teach you because uh, everything that you need to do in here, we've already done in class. At some point you're going to take a derivative. I taught you how to take derivatives. I taught you how to different things explicitly. So, pretty much just knowing this as a strategy is what you need to know from here. And uh, of course, you should read this handout in detail because I, I do point out some things uh, that you want to pay attention to that I'm probably glossing on. But uh, that being said, uh, let's actually just jump into some problems. So. So the first one is not going to be so bad, and, but we're still going to take it a little bit slow so you can see the process. Um, ask me whatever questions you want to ask me. Make sure you know why I did each step that I did. Diagram of the situation. 
So this is a right circular cylinder, so I know it looks like this. I know the radius is going to be the number here, the height is going to be the number here. Right circular cylinder means that the axis is perpendicular to the base, so it's just a straight up cylinder. Okay. Now the radius is increasing and the height is increasing, so it's getting longer and it's getting wider at the same time, for whatever reason. Now, this particular diagram, not too helpful in, uh, in coming up with a formula other than just, you know, conjuring up terrifying memories from high school geometry. Like, you'd have seen this diagram tons of times, and you'd have seen the same thing written below it tons of times. Uh, we want to be able to describe uh, the volume. So V is volume, it's not going to be physically present in the picture, it's just some calculation that we can do. Uh, so, we move on to step three. Step three, we're going to write down what we know and what we want. What do we know about the situation? Well, I know that the radius is increasing at a rate of one meter per second. This means dr dt, right? I, I like to write out the lightness notation of these problems just to emphasize, just to remind myself that T is the independent variable. So when I see a prime, sometimes if I just write R prime equals something, you're going to think, you, people still think that X is the independent variable. So I always write down the Leibniz notation here. It's one. I know that D H D T is two. I'm going to talk about those values as well. I want you to take note that this is a plus one and a plus two. Uh, we'll deal with that a little bit later. At least can anyone tell me why it's a plus one and a plus two? Yeah? Because it's increasing, right? We know increasing means positive slope, decreasing means negative slope. So they describe something as increasing. Whenever I write down the derivative, it has to have a positive value. If it describes something as decreasing, whenever I write down a derivative, it should have a negative value. This is why reading is an important step. You need to pay attention to all that. Increasing versus decreasing, the situation, what shape would be up here, etc. Okay? Uh, so those are the things we know. What do we want? Well, we want to know how fast is the volume changing when the radius is 1 and the height is 3. So I write down what I know and what I want to find. Yeah. Yep. So, so would we just like use the volume equation and then do the derivative of the equation just plug in the value? Exactly. So that is, that is step four. Step four is to come up with an equation that relates all the variables that you've had before. So if there's a variable of r, h, and v. Can you come up with an equation that relates all of them? Uh, what is the volume of a right cylinder? R squared times r squared times height. In fact, that's the volume of any cylinder. It's the area of the base times the height. Any right cylinder, that would be. So if there was a triangular shape that's running like this, the area of the triangle times the height. Um, so that's the equation. So I read the problem. I know what's going on. I know when rates are positive versus negative. I know what shape I'm looking at now. Then I label all the things that are changing with variables. And now I just come up with an equation that connects all the variables that I had previously. This is the equation that will connect all the variables that I had previously. This is the relationship between the variables. This leads me to step five. I'm going to differentiate. With respect to time. Right? So, what is the derivative of v with respect to time? It's going to be dv over dt. dv dt. How do I differentiate this side? Times i times 2r times dr dt times dhdt. No. What's wrong? Yeah. Have to use the product rule. Have to use the product rule. All the rules apply all the time. R is one function of t. H is another function of t. There's a product of functions here. You need the product rule. So what we're going to do is we're going to differentiate the r first, leave the h, then differentiate the h, leave the r. So it's pi times 
2 r d r d t. It's d r d t because I'm differentiating implicitly with respect to time. And I leave the h alone. Plus, now I leave the r alone and I differentiate the h, which is d h d. So I apply the product rule. you do an implicit differentiation, chain rule, because it's implicit. So my r is some function of time that I just, I probably don't, I don't know what it is exactly. And my h is some function of time I don't know what it is exactly. But I can differentiate that. Now at step six, what are we going to do? Plug in. Solve for what you want. Now, you said what you want in step three. You know at the end of the day, I need to say dv dt equals something. So I'm going to go into this equation, and the hope is I can plug in everything except the dv dt, and I can solve for it. Now, in this case, the dv dt is already solved for by itself on one side of the equation. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to plug in uh, all these values. Now. I would have over here uh, pi times 2 times r, I know my r is 1, times dr dt, I know that's also 1, times h, I know that's 3. Right? So this is why it's nice to have this all laid out for you. You don't have to go back and read the word problem. And, you know, you look back at a word problem several times, you're going to mix up one of the numbers. Have everything laid out so you can do it. Okay, that's that, that's that, that's that. Plug it in. Then plus pi times r squared, that's 1 squared, times the h dt. h dt is 2. <coughs> so that's going to be 6 pi plus 2 pi, that is 8 pi. And this would, of course, be uh, what are the units? meters per second, but it's a volume, so this is meters cubed per second. I don't really care about the volumes, uh, the, the, the units, um, but units are helpful, especially when reading the word problem. Sometimes if you, if you see a squared unit mentioned, you know it's an area. If you see a cube unit mentioned, you know it's a volume. But technically, if you just get me the number 8 pi, I'm going to be happy, right? Worry about units in your physics class, but that's uh, that's basically that's the problem. That's the problem that we went went very slowly through, um, but that's uh, the process for a related rates problem. So uh, one, you read you read carefully. Why you need to be able to set up a diagram and label it properly, as well as collect this information. Then using the diagram and the variables here, you're going to come up with an equation that relates all the variables that are mentioned everywhere. Okay? Then you're going to differentiate implicitly with respect to time, and hopefully you'll have enough data from step three to fill in everyone uh, and get the answer in step six. If it shows up here that you don't know the value of somebody, what you would do is you would just go back to step four because you have an equation that relates everybody. Plug in the people that you have, solve for the guy that you don't have then come back here and get the answer. And uh, that's, that's what it is. Let's do it here. I probably want to get some more space here, because the, the other problems might get a little bit longer. Let's move on to problem two. So, first step in a related race one is always to read. Second step would be to get a diagram if I need to. Uh, let's make sure we read. The length of a rectangle is increasing at a rate of 8 centimeters and its width is increasing at a rate of 3 centimeters per second. When the length is 20 and the width is 10, how fast is the area of the rectangle increasing? So, I only care about a rectangle. 
I care about the length and the width of the rectangle. They are both actually moving, so I label them with variables, I label them with letters. And I am setting A equals the area. So I wrote, drew, drew the diagram, I wrote down the variables, A. Now, step three, I'm going to write down what I know, what I want. What do we know so far? What rates do we know? You know DLDT? The length? Eight. So it says the length is increasing at a rate of eight. Okay. We know dw dt. Its width is increasing at a rate of three. And we want to know how fast the area is changing. When l equals twenty and w equals ten. So that's going to be that step. So at this point, I don't even have to look back at the word problem anymore. Everything I want to figure out has been written, has been written on the paper. So my fourth thing is to come up with an equation. Can you relate area, length, and width of a rectangle? Yes. Yes. How? Area equals length times width. That's my equation. Step five will be to differentiate that equation with respect to time. Derivative of A, dA, dT. What is the derivative of LW? DLG, 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 right, product rule. Step six, I'm going to start plugging. Hopefully I have every, all the information I need. Now I want DADT, my DADT is right here. So I don't know what that is yet. But hopefully I know what DLDT is, and I do, that's eight. And W, that's 10, plus DWDT is three times L is 20. So that would give me 80 plus 60, 140 centimeters square per second. But you give me the 140. That's it. That's always it. Let's go through another example. And I can uh, leave this template up here because all the problems are done the same way. ladder was resting against a vertical wall. Suddenly, and without warning, Batman starts pulling the foot of the ladder along the ground, away from the wall, at two feet per second. At what rate is the top of the ladder sliding down the wall when the foot of the ladder is nine feet from the wall? So that's the situation. Uh, so we've read the situation. What is the diagram? It's a right triangle. Right where the wall is the ver 
vertical part. Of course, the ground is down here, and the ladder is, is that line, represented by that line. Now, you'll notice that it forms a right triangle. How will you label that right triangle? Yeah. Um, so I think like the horizontal line for the wall would be negative 2. No. Say How will you label the right triangle? Uh, the floor is, uh, huh? For now, the floor is A, B, and C. A, B, and C. Right here? A. A. No. I don't have a problem with A, B, and C, but the letters themselves I don't care about. Yeah? C is 15. Right? So in the box you'll see, label things that are changing with variables, label things that are constant with constants. The length of the ladder is not going to change. It will always be a 15 foot ladder. You are therefore going to label it A, B, and 15. Why B? Because the length of this is actually changing. Batman is pulling the ladder, which means the length of B is increasing. Now, as he's pulling the ladder, this is going to start sliding down, which means this length is also changing. That is labeled with the variable. The length of the ladder itself is not going to change. Label that with a number. It's always 15. Yeah. So if the length of A is decreasing and it's changing at the rate of 2 feet per second, wouldn't it be negative 2 feet per second? For, for what? A, for the A. So actually A is what we don't know. If you read the question, you'll realize that A is the part we don't know. We know about B. Right, this is where, this is where the foot of the ladder is. Right, that is being pulled away. And we know how far fast that is being pulled away. So what I do know is that I know dB dt. And what's the value of dB dt? Two, positive two. How do I know it's positive two? Well, if he's pulling it away from the wall, the wall is here, he's pulling it that way, this is going to get longer. So it's increasing. So dB dt is positive two. At what rate is the top of the ladder sliding down the wall? So they're actually asking me, how fast is this moving down? Right, so the DA, DT is what I want. When, how do I describe the when? What's the situation I want? Right? We want that when the foot of the ladder is 9 feet from the wall. How do I describe that? B equals 9. So that's the situation. This is the fully labeled diagram. I know this. I want that when B equals 9. What is the equation? A squared plus B squared. A squared plus B squared equals 15 squared. Pythagoras' is theorem. So now, what are we going to do? Differentiate. That's the next step. 2A dA dt plus 2B dB dt equals uh, differentiate derivative of 15 squared. That's 2 times 15. Right? No. I want to see who was going to say yes. Just throw the eraser at them. <laughs> Two days before the test, if you don't know how to differentiate 15 squared, that's zero. By the way, this is one of the potential issues of labeling it with too many letters. If you had a C here, here you'd have 2C, D, C, D, T. What I've seen happen is that a lot of students get to that point and they're like, I have too many unknowns, I don't, I don't know enough data. But if they remembered C was a constant, the DC, DT would be zero, and they would know they wouldn't have to worry about that. But I've seen students get stuck worrying about that. And it all started because they didn't label it a constant in the first place. Label it a constant, it'll, it'll disappear, and you won't, you'll know, there's not an extra variable for you to worry about. You won't have to worry about it. So I've seen students get into a situation where they, they have too many letters. I, I don't know what all these are. I'm like, dude, that's zero. It's, it's a constant. So that is what we have. 
Now we want dA dt. I can actually solve for that. Uh, dA dt is going to be, well, I move this over, can divide both sides by 2, so it's minus d dB dt divided by A. Okay, so uh, what am I going to plug in? Do I have anything? A. A. I don't know what A is. So A. What do I do? Panic. Give up. <laughs> no. <laughs> you said anytime you go to step six and you don't have something, go back to step four. Right? So in order to find the ABT, I need to plug in that. I don't know what that is. I'm going to go back to step four and try to find that. There's a relationship here that tells me how to find the ABT. I know that uh, back to four, uh, I know that a squared plus the b squared, and my b now is nine, is equal to 15 squared. Now this means that a is 12, right? We know that that quickly, not because we squared 15 and subtracted 9 squared, but it's a 3, 4, 5 triangle, right? So this here uh, is 5 times 3. Here, at some point, it's not always 5 times 3. But if I look at, five, if I look at another triangle, if this is 5 times 3, and I know that that's 3 times 3, then this other side must be 4 times 3. So 3, 4, 5. Uh, so my A is 12, I went back to step 4, figured out what the A is, now I just come back and I plug it in. Minus B, minus 9, times dB dt is 2, divided by A, which is 12. So this becomes 2 goes into that, 6 times, 2 goes into the, uh, 3 goes into that, 2 times. So this is minus 3 over 2. Now I want you to recognize that this negative sign is actually important. That actually tells us what? A is decreasing, which makes sense, right? So if you go to a, get to a point like this, your answer needs to make sense. Now you might not know exactly what the value is, but definitely a positive or negative sign should indicate to you whether or not you were kind of on the right track. Um, it should be a negative here. If you got to this point and you got a positive answer, something's wrong because that A is getting smaller. Um, so yeah, it's minus 3 over 2 uh, feet per second. So every second it will slide down one and a half. We dealt with one of we dealt dealt with a couple potential hiccups. One, I wouldn't say improper, but inefficient labeling can cause an issue at this point. And two, every now and then you get to a situation in step six where you don't know everything. But whenever you're in that situation, you go back to the step four situation, solve for the thing you need to know, and then you can come back.
So the volume of a sphere is increasing at a rate of 5 cubic feet per second. How fast is the radius increasing when the radius is 2 feet in length? And I gave you the formula there. So me giving you the formula actually means you don't really need the diagram.
we will stop there. On Wednesday, I will see you for the test. Go through the review, make sure you create that study sheet and start memorizing the things you need to memorize. Like you're doing this, I don't care about this. Yeah. So.